Chapter 10. Starting the Service Herbert Major was used to wide open country. He came from the little town of Dorrance in the USA, in the middle of the immense Kansas wheat fields, where fast, straight roads took him anywhere he needed to go. However, Herb wasn't at Dorrance, Kansas, but at Doro in the Sudan, the same station as George Morrow. He had ridden in there on muleback from Rosaires, 125 slow miles through boggy, rain-soaked bush. His family, left in Khartoum, would have to wait five months for the dry season before they could join him. Even then, they would have a long, hard journey. Was there an alternative? Could he get an airstrip cleared at Doro? A few months earlier, those Englishmen from this new aviation fellowship had been to Doro with Mal Forsberg. They'd considered an airstrip feasible. Someone would have to provide one soon. Why wait? The work needed was daunting. The good news was that the length of ground near the mission station was not pure cotton soil. It was part sand and silt. The bad news was that this particular spot, unlike much of the surrounding grasslands, was covered by thick undergrowth and trees. There were many palms and worse, some baobabs, up to 60 feet high and 30 feet in diameter. An axe stuck in their pulpy trunks if anybody attempted to cut them down. They would have to be burned. For good measure, there were numerous termite hills, hard, solid, and nine feet tall. How could the job be tackled? The mission had few tools, and the local Maban would need persuading to help. It wasn't work they took to naturally, and it would be long and hard. Moreover, now in the rainy season, they'd be busy with their crops, and money wouldn't tempt them. Herb and George consulted Mal Forsberg, who encouraged them to go ahead. Mal wrote his own account of what happened. They decided that they would have to get the people excited enough about the coming of the plane to work on the airstrip. They called the chiefs together. One of those things that flies overhead is going to land here, they explained. It needs a long, clear place for sitting down. It was hard to explain why the little speck on the horizon needed a long space in which to sit down. It has wheels, it comes down fast, and can't stop quickly. The Mabans had seen wheels on cars and trucks. They had cleared the roads of grass each year to allow vehicles to travel during the dry season. But the thing in the sky didn't need a road. And besides, when birds landed, they didn't need much room. They could land on the branch of a tree. The conversation went back and forth. Where's the plane? In Khartoum. What will it come here for? To bring my wife and two children. Are you going to let your wife and babies go up in that thing? It will bring my wife and babies just as soon as you make a place for it to sit down. The Mabans were talking it up now. They had seen mysterious commercial aircraft flying overhead. They had never understood how the planes got up so high and stayed there. They had heard that men and women were in the planes. How small were these men and women? The planes that contained them were only specks in the sky. The head chief spoke. We'll clear the place. Maban from different villages came at different times to work on the airstrip. Before it was ready, well over 1,000 people had toiled on it. 1,000 trees had been cleared and eight weeks had elapsed. Tree root holes were filled in and the strip was finally smoothed by dragging a heavy beam over it, towed by George's old Ford truck. The end result was an 800-yard strip, clear and level, better than most of the mission strips in the south. In Khartoum, a telegram arrived for us. It read, My truck can go 40 mph on airstrip after first dragging. George. Nine days later came another telegram, Strip ready. 50 mph over strip. Car won't go faster. A week later, I passed my WT operator's Morse test, rather to my surprise and greatly to my relief. 
The license approved, we were free to start operations. Exactly another week later, we set off in the Rapide to fly first to Malakal and then to Doro. The early morning flight from Khartoum to Malakal was smooth. This was nice for our passengers. Mal Forsberg, Herb's wife Mary Ethel, their two small children, and another lady missionary. As we flew, I had to use not only Morse code, but also the international Q code, which enables messages to be passed in shorter form and with less chance of misunderstanding than ordinary words put into Morse. All our departure and arrival times, altitude, position, and other information were transmitted in the Q code. This flight began a special era for me. For the next seven years, the radio operator's compartment became my home on the plane. From it, I was always in touch with the pilot just in front of me. During many difficult landings or takeoffs, I'd find I was either praying us safely down or praying us safely up. Our airstrips were short, their surface and condition frequently unknown, often soft and dangerous. Our plane had its limitations for takeoff, sometimes finding it difficult to climb steeply out of a small airstrip slotted in amidst trees. It also had its limitations for landing, only two small air brakes to help slow it down on the approach. They gave no extra lift like the flaps of a modern aircraft. Also, our wheel brakes were the old-style cable ones. From my radio operator's seat, I kept an eye on the passengers and learned a lot about their reactions to travelling in small MAF planes. I used to provide them with tea from a thermos. I enjoyed giving a good cabin service. Anyway, I liked having a cup of tea myself. On this inaugural trip as radio operator, I was quite anxious. But the air radio operator at Malakal knew I had only just acquired my license, so he sent his messages slowly, repeating them whenever necessary. I later learned to like the radio work, coming to love the sing-song of the Morse notes as they came through and enjoyed tapping back messages and responses in similar musical rhythm. I appreciated the coded talking back and forth with the Sudanese radio operators throughout the Sudan. They included me in their camaraderie. At the end of a hard day's flying, it was nice to get the final Morse message from the operator on the ground. G-N-O-M. Good night, old man. Both the transmitter and the receiver were enormous. The transmitter had two eight-inch tall, old-fashioned thermionic valves, the kind that slowly warmed up to emit a bright orange glow. They were a total contrast to later miniaturized transistors. The set could operate at nearly full power, even with one of these valves out of action. They threw out quite a bit of heat. I always said that you could have made toast between them. When we landed at Malakal, we found the officials as excited as we were about this first flight into Doro. They knew, as we did, that finding the mission in the featureless expanse of grassland was not going to be easy. The district commissioner for the Maban area asked whether we'd be able to take government officials soon. We replied we'd be more than happy, but the Khartoum authorities would have to authorise it first. I went to see the air radio operator in his little hut on the airfield and thanked him for his help. We discussed procedures for this exploratory flight into Doro and arranged to make contact every 15 minutes. Only Steve and I's crew, and Mal Forsberg as a guide who knew the area, were allowed by the civil aviation authorities to make the first proving flight to Doro. The strip must be tried out before we took any other passengers. The women and children waved us off, then waited in Malakal. As we flew on our compass course to Doro, we soon saw why several years before the RAF had experienced problems in locating any of the mission stations. There were no identifiable landmarks at all, just an endless expanse of vague, flat, barren grassland 
with occasional ill-defined trails, seasonal streams, small groups of trees or patches of bush. We flew high enough to get a good overview of the countryside. I peered constantly through our drift sight, checking to what extent any winds might be blowing us off track. Steve adjusted our heading accordingly. After an hour and a quarter, we should have arrived over Doro, but could see nothing of it. Neither could Mal. Steve was tense. Was this going to be a repeat of the RAF episode? The eager air radio operator in Malakal came through my headphones in Morse. Can you see Doro? No, I tapped back. Looking. We'll call on sight, Doro. Off to the right, we picked out the winding thread of what we thought must be the little Yarbus River. Doro should be near it. I'm starting a square search procedure, called Steve. I passed the word back to Mal, still scanning the unrevealing countryside below. Suddenly Steve called, There's the strip! Only then did we spot the much less obvious roofs of the mission buildings nearby. The strip looked splendid, clearly defined with white markers along the sides. Herb and George had obviously seen us coming. They had a smoke fire burning to show us the direction of the wind. Steve circled a few times, sizing up the strip and its surroundings, and then came in to land. QGV Doro QAL, I morsed in QCO to Malakal. Seen Doro, landing. We tightened our belts. We could see Herb and George on one side, and the many upturned faces of Maban tribespeople all along the edge amidst the debris of cleared brush and undergrowth. As Steve brought the plane down, three goats, frightened by the motors, dashed right across the strip in front of us. George and two Mabans leapt forward like the lightning ball boys at Wimbledon and scurried them off just in time. Steve put the plane down smoothly on the excellent strip. Herb was first at the cabin door as I swung it open. Behind him were crowds of Mabans, clutching their spears and wide-eyed with interest. Herb was a big man, and he had a big smile as he greeted us. I have never been so excited in all my life, he said. We could see that this was true. We were excited too. So were the Mabans. They were seeing a plane on the ground for the first time at last. They looked closely at us foolhardy people, who travelled in such a strange and dangerous vehicle. We spent the rest of the day looking at the airstrip and working on the plane. Early the following morning, we flew back to Malakal. The governor, John Winder, wanted to discuss plans with us. He was helpful and supportive, but had three main questions. How has the flight to Doro worked out? He was satisfied with our report on that. Why don't you come and base in Malakal? That would be the best centre of communications. We understood his reasoning, but were not yet sure. Should I be contacting the Civil Aviation Authorities in Khartoum to get permission for my district commissioners to be carried by your plane? We replied that the Civil Air Secretary would be the one to authorise that. The same afternoon, we flew back to Doro with Mary Ethel and the children. It gave us great satisfaction to see the major family reunited. God was good. Our regular operations had made a very positive start. We now had to get to the Okobo area to meet the needs of Don McClure and his fellow workers there. Further flight requests were coming in. We needed to develop the service as quickly as possible. We must get ourselves a base in southern Sudan. Then Steve could bring his family from South Africa. We didn't take the governor's advice to base at Malakal. To put it bluntly, we couldn't afford to. Mild May's financial position had continued to worsen and we had very little money of our own. We decided instead to start at Okobo, where we'd been offered some spare temporary accommodation rent-free. There was a telegraph office at the nearby government post. We wouldn't be too cut off. A new alignment had been approved 
for the Okobo airstrip. It should be a bit more weatherproof because the soil was a little better. The district commissioner had men working on it from both the Anuak and Nua tribes in the area. As an incentive, he organised a competition to see who could clear the most in the shortest time. The prize was a bull. The Nuas won. When we landed there, the new strip was smooth and even. For me, coming back to Okobo was like coming home. I always loved the picturesque, low-thatched houses at the mission and found the quiet river flowing lazily past tremendously peaceful. I liked to sit by it in the cool of the dawn, to have my time with God before the work of the day began. So it was that Okobo, with the American Presbyterian Mission and the Anuak people, was our first MAF base in southern Sudan. Everyone there, including us, worked very hard during the week. When we weren't away flying, Steve and I would be working on the plane or trying to improve the airstrip. Saturday evenings were different. As the sun's heat waned, we'd all relax and play volleyball until darkness stopped us. On Sundays we'd go to the Anuak church services, and on Sunday evenings have fellowship and prayer together, sharing one another's burdens, sometimes in English, sometimes in Anuak. One prayer by an Anuak leader was translated for us by Don McClure. Lord God, bless the men with the aeroplane and keep them safe. I don't know, Lord, how you keep up with them. They fly so fast. We were grateful that God could more than keep up with us. He was always ahead. It was at the end of November, in the dry season of 1950, that we came to Okobo. Steve and I spent Christmas there. On Christmas Eve, a Sunday, we all joined with the Anuak at the Okobo Mission Church. A lame Anuak woman arrived there on her hands and knees, having crawled all the way from her village. The missionaries took her back home in the jeep. They'd have fetched her too if they'd known in time. I was impressed by the love and care they showed in their dealings with their African brothers and sisters. The morning service was followed by baptisms in the river. Men and women declared their new life in Jesus Christ. Charms and gourds used in spirit worship floated downstream as the Anuak cast them off to signify their new allegiance. Africans and missionaries then clambered into canoes and the missionaries' three small boats with outboard motors. We went six miles upriver to another Anuak village where more baptisms and a communion service were held. After an early morning service on Christmas Day, a big feast was prepared. A bull had been killed for the communal dinner, and large basins of dura, the local millet, were set aside alongside the meat. Anuak and missionary joined in the meal, dipping hands together into the bowls. To our western nostrils, the smell of the food was exceptionally strong, so we ate with less enthusiasm than the Anuak but the fellowship was tremendous. By mid-afternoon, Steve and I were back at the aeroplane, getting it ready for an early flight the next day. The demands of the work were ceaseless, but we had no complaints. It was good to be where God wanted us. Now that we had a base, Steve could get his family. We took the rapide on a long trip south to Nairobi, carrying a full load of missionaries who needed a break from the Sudan heat. I stayed in Nairobi while essential maintenance was carried out on our plane. Steve travelled on down to Johannesburg, returning with the whole family in a plane he'd been employed to ferry to Nairobi. Finally, we all flew to Bakobo in the Rapide. There, one of the American mission families kindly made room for me in their house. The Stevens and their three girls, Merle, Pam and Colleen, moved in with another American family. The very first night they were attacked and bitten by invading army ants. Kay spent the next couple of days beginning to get acclimatized to housekeeping in southern Sudan. Then came the fire. 
Three nights after our arrival, the house where Steve and Kay were living burst into flames. An oil lamp started it, igniting a long, dry stalk which fell from the roof and sent a flame upwards into the thatch. In no time, the roof was ablaze from end to end. In the other house, we heard the commotion and rushed out, horrified. It was a relief to find that everyone had escaped unhurt. But almost everything in the house was lost, including all the Stevens' possessions, even their passports. The fire blazed late into the night, a devastating experience for the newly arrived family. Steve and Kay moved to a little used and not very well repaired government rest house a mile away, which the sympathetic district commissioner said MAF could occupy for the time being. A flight to NASA later that week carried news of the catastrophe. There was an immediate response from the generous missionaries. We returned to Okobo with a plane full of clothes, kitchen utensils, and even a paraffin stove. We looked like a winged removal van full of household equipment. After a few weeks, Kay and Steve invited me to move in with them at the rest house so that we could be together. Kay had to work with very limited supplies and hardly any equipment, and now she had me to cater for as well. I appreciated all she did in that strange, difficult and primitive environment. The roof of the government rest house leaked freely when it rained. Wide gaps between walls and roof provided easy access for various creatures. Mosquitoes and bats flew in at night, and you never knew when you might find a scorpion or even a snake. I took photos of Merle holding a large spitting cobra by the tail and of little Pam dangling its severed head from a string. In the months that followed, airstrip after airstrip was sighted, cleared, and brought into use. My flying logbook and diaries tell of hundreds of exciting and rewarding flights. A fresh sense of relief and mobility came to the missionaries. Aerial surveys were carried out to locate people who were still unreached. There was new ability to help the Sudanese, either by bringing in doctors or by getting seriously ill patients to medical care at some bigger centre. We saw the whole area opening up. Later, with the agreement of the Civil Aviation Department, our planes were used by the provincial government too. Our rapide became a welcome sight to many. We put a name on its nose in Arabic. As for Allah, God's bird. <laughs>